stories I remember very well was uh, in my early days of guided missiles. I was 27. Hal Rosen, the young PhD we had in California, was 25. And uh, the Bell Telephone Laboratories was the renowned organization at that time. And a guy named Pierce, Nobel Prize winner, invented the traveling wave tube, said that uh, a homing seeker, when it gets close to a target, will get absolutely confused by all the reflections, all the noise, it will just go wild. And Harold Rosen, as a 25-year-old kid, sort of not dry behind the ears, said, what does Pierce know about homing missiles? We know homing missiles. He doesn't know anything about them. The fact that he won a Nobel Prize, totally irrelevant. And guy and Harold Rosen tried to be right. Now, subsequently to that, Harold Rosen became the father of satellite communications for Hughes and built up a $2 billion business for Hughes. He became a scientist in his own right. But at 25 years old, he's willing to challenge Pierce, you know, who was, a, who was an eminent uh, authority on everything at that time. Well, that's the kind of spirit we had. when a few young men with good ideas and a few dollars could make a difference. Lawrence K. Marshall was such a man, as was his friend and college roommate from Tufts, Vannevar Bush, and inventor Charles G. Smith. Born with an insatiable curiosity and always receptive to new ideas, Lawrence Marshall was introduced to an exciting new product invented by a young mechanic from the north woods of Maine. Al Spencer, a bimetallic thermostatic device that changed its shape when exposed to heat. As a teenager, Spencer had worked in a mill in Maine. His job was to keep the furnace stoked. He noticed that as the furnace began to cool, the metal door would buckle in with a loud snap that signaled him to stoke the fire again. With Al Spencer, Marshall formed the Spencer Thermostat Company to manufacture thermostats for flat irons, which in those days were heated on stoves, but now could be made to run electrically. The thermostat was a major new development. Within a short time, Marshall sold the product and patent to the Westinghouse Company. The company was enriched. The invention was hailed as a classic Horatio Alger story, a simple idea that made millions. Anyway, the Spencer thermostat was launched, and it was an important... Lawrence Marshall's wife, Lorna Jean Marshall, remembers. In those days. And then C.G. Smith came to Lawrence with an idea about a refrigerator. And he says that they were just walking up the hill at Tufts one morning when he told Lawrence about the refrigerator, and Lawrence was interested and said that they should do something about it. The invention spurred Marshall, Bush, and C.G. Smith to formalize their relationship as the American Appliance Company, all but certain that Smith's gas refrigerator would revolutionize American kitchens. Marshall set out cross-country to test the market. The refrigerator didn't work. Its model worked, but when they made the full-size thing, it didn't. But Marshall knew the future would not be in thermostats, nor in refrigerators. He turned his attention toward a whole new business. In the early 1920s, radio was on the verge of explosive popularity. But the technology was crude and inconvenient. Radios were large and powered by bulky, expensive batteries that required frequent replacement. When C.G. Smith joined Marshall, he brought with him patents for a gaseous rectifier called the S-tube. This transmitting tube had found a small market among ham radio operators. But Marshall saw a greater opportunity. In 1924, he encouraged Smith to develop a receiving tube for home radios that would eliminate the need for batteries. The B-tube enabled the radio to be plugged 
directly into household current. It was a milestone event in the development of radio technology with enormous impact on a huge market of consumers. To prepare for the demand, the little company quickly expanded. Believing the tube needed a trade name, Marshall solicited his employees for ideas. Miles Pennybacker, a young sales engineer, suggested a name that, to his astonishment, everyone liked. Raytheon, Ray of the Gods. A year later, as its fame spread, the American Appliance Company of Massachusetts came to the attention of the American Appliance Company of Indiana. It warned its eastern counterpart to cease and desist using the same name. Marshall readily concurred, deciding to rechristen his company after its product, Raytheon Manufacturing Company. Raytheon was one of many. As radio became more convenient and more affordable, over a hundred companies vied for market share. Lawrence Marshall was worried that Raytheon might be buried by the competition. He looked for new ways to be first and best. Thermostat inventor Al Spencer brought his younger brother Percy to Marshall's attention. Marshall agreed to hire the young man, who had no formal education, as a production supervisor. He had no idea at the time that his decision would have such an impact on the company. But here was a man who could genuinely be called a, a genius. He was, had an inquiring mind, an acute ability to get to understand the uh, phenomena of one sort or another that intrigued him. And he never forgot any of this. Very, very bright individual, highly motivated, tremendous energy, and great skill. Very practical man. The thing I remember about him is his tremendous drive, the will to succeed. Percy Spencer was constantly refining Raytheon's tubes, and the company became a credible competitor in the radio field, quickly earning the notice and the respect of the four giants of the electronics industry. They were known as the club, RCA, Westinghouse, GE, AT&T. Technological skill had made Raytheon a player, but it was the character of these founders that made the company play to win. Lawrence Marshall, son of a meat wholesaler, entrepreneur, engineer. His main focus seemed always to be outside of himself, so that when he was with people, his rapport with them was an empathy and, and realization of them. And I think that made a difference in Raytheon. The thing that impressed me with him was that uh, he understood what I, what I was doing. And also, he had a picture of where the technology was moving outside of Raytheon. And he could assess the gap between what we were doing and what the future might be a year or two down the road. I was amazed by that. Marshall's closest associate was Vannevar Bush, a brilliant academic, a minister's son, a scientist. It was Bush who challenged the power of the giants in the radio business, specifically Westinghouse. Certain that they'd copied Raytheon's tube design, which included a patented short path feature, Bush confronted the Westinghouse patent attorney. He wrote at that meeting. He showed me the Westinghouse tube. The glass was coated so that one could not see inside. But he told me Westinghouse did not use the short path idea and hence did not infringe. I said, crack it. He looked at me a moment, and then cracked the tube on the edge of his wastebasket. And here was the short path clearly used. So he smiled and said he would advise the Westinghouse company to keep off the grass. Aggressive, brash, even zealous, Raytheon gained an early reputation for not knuckling under. Sales reached $1 million in 1926. Still, the big manufacturers continued to churn out copies of Raytheon's revolutionary radio tubes. Unhappy about prospects for endless legal wrangling, Lawrence Marshall decided if he couldn't beat them, he'd join them by trading licensing agreements. The complex deal-making ultimately worked in his favor. By 1929, Raytheon was in a new factory in Newton, Massachusetts, producing up to 40,000 radio tubes per day, 
for receiving and transmitting. That the only thing we have to fear is... Fear. During the Depression years of the early 1930s, Raytheon held its own, even in the face of tough competition from almost 100 manufacturers of tubes. The company's size expanded and contracted. But toward the end of the decade, events overseas would turn the company in a momentous new direction. Radio tubes that transmitted microwave energy had potential applications for a new invention, radar. Former Raytheon Vice President Fritz Gross recalls. We were recommended to the Navy by MIT. They asked whether we could give them a proposal on designing and building a shipboard microwave radar. At that time, there were uh, uh, lower frequency radars in the VHF range. And I had seen some of this work. Well, after the Navy came up, they invited us down to Naval Research Labs, and we saw what had been going on. That's where I saw my first radar. At the heart of radar was the magnetron tube, a complex piece of technology that was difficult and time-consuming to make. Under siege by Nazi bombs, the British were desperate to boost magnetron production. The British came to the United States to try to get the United States to produce more of these magnetrons than they could because they had to machine each tube out of a solid casting of copper. And that took a lot of skilled labor, a lot of time, and they couldn't produce enough. It was brought to Marshall. Marshall said this is something for Percy. Percy said, well, give me the damn thing and let me take it home for the weekend. Oh, no, no, we can't do that. It's one of a kind. It's top secret. Well, Percy said, if you won't let me take it and think about it, I can't help you. I'm sorry. They said, well, all right, you can take it. So off he goes with this thing and ponders about it. And into his mind come bits and pieces of, of solutions to problems that he'd seen in the past. So he he came back on Monday and said, I tell you what I think we should do with this thing. Instead of starting with copper bar stock four inches in diameter, we will use laminated copper, an eighth of an inch thick. And we will stamp this configuration out instead of drilling it out. We will then stack them up. Well, how are you going to make them fit, you know? We will put silver solder between them that can, conforms with the thing. We we'll put the whole thing through a brazing oven. In the brazing oven, we will have a jig made of stainless steel that has a certain property that will expand more rapidly than the copper will. It will lock these bits, these slices, into precise conformity. When the whole thing comes out the other end, it will meet spec. Well, uh, this was an astonishing concept, but it worked. It worked perfectly. And in a very short time, uh, by using a stamping process, which is a mass production process, using a continuous brazing oven, which is a mass producing process, out were coming magnetrons like sausages. As a result, almost overnight, production went from 17 units a week to several thousand. By the end of the war, Raytheon was making almost 80% of all magnetrons used by the Allied forces. For his efforts, Percy Spencer was awarded the Navy's highest honor to a civilian, the Distinguished Public Service Award. As the war spread into the Pacific, Raytheon expanded from magnetrons to complete shipboard radar systems. In the Coral Sea, Japanese and American fleets engaged in battle, never close enough to actually see each other. The Japanese were stunned that their ships were so easily found by American fighter planes. More than any other piece of equipment, the Model SG surface search radar was hailed as the deciding factor in thwarting the enemy in this pivotal battle. For the first time, radar had turned the war around. 
At the same time, the company continued its leadership in vacuum tube technology, now exploring the limits of miniaturization. Former Vice President Norman Krim remembers the development of the proximity fuse tube. And the idea of the proximity fuse, uh, you had a very small radio transmitter in the, uh, in the shell, in the front of the shell, and uh, you also had a small radio receiver in the front of the shell. And as you neared the target, you, the signals came out of the front of the shell, out of the radio transmitter, and they were reflected from the uh, target, the airplane, or in some cases the ground, and they would come back to the shell into the radio receiver. And when you were at the approximate distance that you were set for, like 50 feet away from the aircraft, or 100 feet away, the shell would explode. And this device used three sub-miniature tubes, and uh, those are the tubes that we were producing. And they raised the accuracy of the aircraft they could knock down from maybe 5% up to 90%. It was a, a very, very important invention. And Dr. Vannevar Bush's book, A Piece of the Action, he rated the atomic bomb as the most important thing that helped win the war. Radar is the second most important thing, and the proximity fuse was the third most important technical invention that we made that would win the war. In Chicago, tears of joy mingled with cheers as a million people sang and danced in the streets. Raytheon had annual sales of $6 million for the year 1942. In 1945, it had soared to $173 million. But Lawrence Marshall was worried. Most company business was related to the war effort. Marshall looked around for new directions. He had a group of people down to his home in Cambridge about six months before the end of the war, and he encouraged everyone to work on commercial projects at that time. And we had about, uh, I don't know, eight or nine or ten people. And we discussed different projects that would uh, be good for the company after the war. And they included the microwave oven as a cooking device. They included microwave relays. They included uh, pocket radios, which I had suggested. And uh, they obviously included radar for commercial shipping, because we were experts in that field. And... Uh, there were maybe 20 or 30 ideas, but we were working on how we were going to perpetuate the company. And he led the discussions. And he kind of, uh, if we're getting too far off the track, he brought us back. A key figure in this period of transition was Charles Francis Adams, who had joined the board of Raytheon in 1938. The descendant of two American presidents, Adams served with the Navy in the war before returning to the company to work closely alongside Lawrence Marshall. In 1948, he became president of Raytheon and helped guide it in new directions. Marshall saw a very uh, clear and obvious uh, market for this Raytheon Navy surface search radar as a navigational instrument for the world's merchant marines. But he had no outlet. The submarine signal had sold uh, submarine signal devices, uh, depth sounders and uh, uh, listening gear that directed you to a submarine bell, which was by this time obsolete. But they had marine distribution. They had relationships with these ship operators. And uh, that would give um, Raytheon an outlet if they were merged together for this new Raytheon radar product, which they called the Mariner's Pathfinder. So the merged company uh, was substantially stronger as a result of the uh, submarine signal acquisition. that happened next is that uh, Raytheon bought the Belmont Radio Company out in Chicago. Belmont Radio Company at that time was a $40 million a year business, plus or minus, and they had many private label accounts. And uh, we were interested in that uh, back at the tube company because that would, that would give us a, a market for our receiving tubes. The name Belmont was virtually unknown to the public. 
The name Raytheon was especially unknown to the public. And we were up against household names like RCA, and Zenith, uh, Motorola, and many others. But we decided that uh, we'd give this a go. And we actually innovated some things. Uh, one was a set we called the Tin Can Set. Uh, people who can remember TV in those days were looking at a big wooden cabinet with a little picture in the middle of it. The Tin Can Set, you looked at it, and all you saw was the tube. The controls and the speakers were down on the side so that you were looking at a picture and nothing else. In time, the company's excursion into the manufacture of television sets would fail, overwhelmed by larger electronics companies with much wider access to retail distributors. But Raytheon was exploring several other developments. From Percy Spencer, Lawrence Marshall got the idea that magnetron tubes, the main component of radar, had properties that might have a commercial application. Magnetrons generated heat. Marshall was intrigued by the possibilities. He had come over to my office around 5 o'clock, and uh, I guess about uh, 7 o'clock, uh, we were out in his car, went and bought a, uh, a uh, standard garbage bucket and laid it on its side, cut a hole in the back, put a magnetron probe, the output of a magnetron into it, and uh, tried it out. It would take years for Raytheon's work in microwave cooking to produce big profits. But before finding their way into America's kitchens, Raytheon's radar range ovens became a regular fixture on passenger trains and in institutional vending machines. Television, tubes for hearing aids, transistors, and other semiconductors. While expanding into these commercial fields, Raytheon found that its post-war fortunes would pivot on new developments spawned by its work in radar technology. Mr. Marshall called me and told me that uh, Raytheon was going in a guided missile. So he was setting up a project. And <laughs> I didn't know what to believe. We didn't have an aeronautical engineer in the house. And... Uh, he said that these missiles were going to use sub-miniature tubes, some of my tubes. And he wanted me to drop everything I was doing that day, I was in Newton, come over to Waltham and meet these new people who were starting a guided missile project. The idea germinated in 1944, when a young engineer named Royden Sanders came to Marshall and proposed that by using continuous wave radar, he could develop a homing device for Navy rockets to find and destroy Japanese kamikaze aircraft. By war's end, the technology was still imperfect and unused. Other companies tried and failed. CW radar, both the transmitter and the rece reception are going on all the time, simultaneously. And that was a very, very difficult thing to accomplish. Most people thought it was impossible, as a matter of fact, except Sanders and the few people here who were, were trying it. So it was exciting. It was exciting because they were working on new radar concepts. Uh, they were trying to work out how to navigate a missile to an intercept of a target, which had never been done before, uh, through homing navigation. Uh, servo mechanisms and uh, feedback systems were brand new at the time, and they were pioneering in those fields. So when I first came here, it was, uh, it was a very exciting place to work. December 18th, 1950. Point Magoo, California. For the first time ever, a guided missile knocked down a moving target in the air. As far as the, the guided missile work is concerned, Raytheon got on the map for being the first of many companies working on the subject to make a guided missile work. Very, very unique, significant accomplishment. Next came contracts for the nation's first supersonic missile, the air-to-air -air Sparrow. And soon after, contracts for an entire missile system to be built completely within Raytheon, a low-altitude surface-to-air missile called Hawk. But in the Hawk, Raytheon acquired and achieved an entire system. The acquisition radar, the control center, the communications, uh, the guided missile, the launchers, the handling equipment, 
uh, the second and third echelon maintenance, the whole thing from soup to nuts. So it was a, you know, I don't think we realized it at the time, but it was the birth of Raytheon getting into the systems business. Government contracts for missile development through the 1950s kept the company strong. In 1953, Raytheon matched its previous peak with sales of $179 million. Five years later, it would be twice that. At the same time, Raytheon continued to establish a foothold in commercial electronics, transistors, and digital computers. To process telemetry data from the test firings of the Lark missile, Raytheon had formed a team of scientists to build digital computers advanced enough to handle the job. They succeeded and wanted newer challenges. So there I found in my hands uh, 200 of the most creative and talented uh, computer engineers that were around. What to do with them? Well, we agreed to form a joint company with a then Minneapolis Honeywell called Datamatic Corporation. They owned half, we owned half, and we were going to go ahead and exploit this field with a device called the Datamatic 1000 which was still vacuum tube technology. The transistor wasn't there at that point. And we made a few of these machines and sold them. The next year's contribution to Datamatic Corporation so that it could have a budget of 16 million to carry the business forward. I had no quarrel with the 16 million. The problem I had was that Raytheon's half was 8 million. Raytheon didn't have 8 million. So here we got a foothold in something that was very intriguing and very interesting, but we simply uh, couldn't afford the stakes uh, to play in that game. By the early 60s, Raytheon knew that too much of its success depended on government contracts. The company sought to diversify its pursuits and its products by acquiring commercial businesses. The need to find businesses uh, either developed from inside or acquired from the outside to balance this inexorable growth, happy growth, if you will, from our point of view of the military side, was essential. Marshall saw it, I saw it, Tom saw it. Thomas L. Phillips joined Raytheon in 1948 as an electronics design engineer at Lab 16. He soon became program manager of the Hawk and Sparrow III guided missile systems. He was named vice president in 1960 and was an obvious choice when Raytheon needed a president in 1964. As I cast about, I said to myself, um, Tom Phillips is clearly without any question uh, the outstanding uh, younger man in the company. It became quite clear that he was a very fast learner, was equipped of an extraordinary degree of innate wisdom and judgment. But even when he was dealing with things that he hadn't uh, much experience with, he uh, had an uncanny knack for not making mistakes. Almost immediately, Tom Phillips announced a long-range plan for acquisition and diversification. Our planning started looking at commercial diversification. And one of the tools we had for diversification was the microwave cooking technology. And I guess the thought came to to me and to others in our planning that, you know, the place where micro cooking is the home. If we could get to the consumer, it'd be wonderful. So we started looking for a consumer appliance company that had distribution, already had distribution to the home. Iowa-based Amana Refrigeration was a natural choice. Amana had a reputation and tradition of exceptional quality and craftsmanship. Next was the educational publishing company, D.C. Heath, in business since the 1880s. In the post-Sputnik era, with its emphasis on education, D.C. Heath seemed an attractive opportunity. And in the energy field, the Seismograph Service Company, makers of geophysical exploration equipment for the oil industry. In 1967, with the help of these and other acquisitions, Raytheon sales topped the $1 billion mark. Before the decade was out, 
Raytheon also acquired two additional energy service companies, the Badger Company of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and United Engineers and Constructors of Philadelphia, and another appliance manufacturer, the Caloric Corporation. Others would soon follow. Through the 60s and 70s, while diversification into commercial products continued, government contracts remained healthy for the Hawk missile program, for the Sam D missile, forerunner of the Patriot, for Sparrow, and later Sidewinder, air traffic control systems, phased array radar, shipboard defense systems, and electronic countermeasures. But Raytheon's commercial acquisitions were not yet finished. 1980, Beach Aircraft of Wichita, one of the oldest and most respected names in general aviation, became the company's largest purchase ever, 10 years after Tom Phillips' first overture. The acquisition completed Raytheon's desired balance of government and commercial business. That was the strategy, to have businesses that we were comfortable with, that the technology was something we could understand, the market something we could understand, but would not be tied to defense expenditures. And hopefully we're going to get smarter and smarter how to market and how to grow. I think the foundation for that is built. I look to my successors to build on it.